Hello everybody and welcome to So I Play Games. I'm your host Scott and today I want to talk about a game called Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. Kingdom Hearts 2 is a real-time action-adventure RPG that was developed and published by Square Enix and released on the PS2 in March of 2007 to Japan exclusively. It was later released internationally in December of 2014 on the PS3 as part of the Kingdom Hearts HD 2.5 Remix. It was further released on the PS4, Xbox, and Epic Store at later dates as an all-in-one package having all 10 games from Kingdom Hearts 1 to Kingdom Hearts 3 with a couple being only the cutscenes from their respected games. In Kingdom Hearts 2, you're introduced to a new character called Roxas. You follow Roxas around Twilight Town while he hangs out with his friends and slowly discovers who he really is and the real purpose of his existence. Later on, you return to the original team of Sora, Donald, and Goofy, where they travel to both new and familiar worlds in search of Riku and King Mickey, all the while learning about the new group who call themselves Organization 13 and the creatures called Nobodies that have mysteriously started showing up. The story begins in Twilight Town with Roxas and his friends Hainer, Pence, and Olette. You find out that they've been accused of stealing something, an object, and the word itself. Knowing that they're innocent, they search Twilight Town for the real culprit. You meet Roxas' rival, Cypher, and are given a selection of weapons to choose from before fighting him. The sword gives plus one strength, the hammer gives plus one defense, and the wand gives plus one magic. You have a brief fight before being introduced to the new unknown enemy. Roxas chases down the enemy and before fighting it is gifted with the Kingdom Keyblade. After defeating the enemy, you find out that it was the one stealing photos and the word itself. All of the photos suspiciously end up being of Roxas. You then transition between scenes from Kingdom Hearts 1 and a percentage of restoration being completed. You also meet two unknown characters, one in a black cloak and the other in a red cloak, who seem to be watching over Roxas. The following day, Roxas and his friends decide to take a vacation to the beach. They spend the next while doing odd jobs collecting money for a ticket to a train. How much money you make before heading to the train station differs on how much of an AP boost you'll get. I'll explain AP later. 200 to 790 money gives you no AP, 800 to 1190 gives you 1 AP, and 1200 to 2000 gives you 2 AP. After Roxas collects his portion of the money, he meets up with his friends at the train station where he runs into a person in a black cloak who steals his money for the tickets. With no money for the tickets, the group leave the station and call it a day. Roxas wakes up the next day to a letter from his friends saying they're going to the beach and to meet him there. On his way to the train station, he runs into a blonde-haired person who knows who he is. He sees her head towards the haunted mansion and decides to follow her. On his way there, he's confronted by more of the unknown enemies, but before he's attacked, he's pulled into a mysterious location with a stained glass flooring of Sora. He's presented with a sword, a shield, and a staff. Your choice here affects what abilities you learn earlier than others. The sword focuses physical and damage-based abilities, the shield focuses defense and survivability, while the staff focuses MP benefits and spell-based attacks. After you choose your weapon, Roxas is surrounded by the unknown enemy. He fights his way through these enemies while also making his way through the stained glass area. Once he makes it to the top, he finds a door that leads him to a much larger version of the enemies he's been fighting. After a brief boss fight, you return to Twilight Town, but the whole day has passed. This is when the adventure really begins. Roxas' past, his connection to the people in the Black Cloaks, and more importantly, his connection to Sora, is explored deeper until his final revelation when he gets to meet Sora. This all leads into finding out what has happened to Sora since Kingdom Hearts 1, along with meeting new, interesting, and even familiar characters who have been assisting in the background. Once you're in control of Sora, you make a quick visit to Yen Sid to learn about the difference between the Heartless, the Nobodies, Organization 13, all the while getting a wardrobe change. Then the search for King Mickey and Riku continues. Right out the gate, the infamous Gummy Ship makes its return, and I have to say, it's a massive improvement from the original. It's a lot more fast-paced and interactive. The Gummy Ship worlds from the original felt like an out-of-place drag between worlds. Kingdom Hearts 2 has more Heartless, better designed levels, more movement with your ship, more customization, new enemies, and bosses that are fun and challenging. I wasn't a fan of customizing my own ship, but not because it was bad. It wasn't for me, and I didn't want to build my own ship. Thankfully, that's made up for in blueprints of pre-built ships that are unlocked as you complete Gummy Ship levels. It was a refreshing new take that had me actually looking forward to traveling between worlds and curious of what I'd unlock next. As for the worlds themselves, Kingdom Hearts 2 brings in new and familiar worlds that feel larger and bring welcoming challenges. 
Square Enix took the original Kingdom Hearts take on worlds and improved on them for the most part. They brought a whole new approach to combat and exploration with each world I visited, which made every world feel like a new experience. They did without platforming for the most part, which was a welcoming change since it wasn't the strongest point in the Kingdom Hearts series, but it would seem minigames have taken its place. I'm not against minigames, but it did feel like they were leaned on too much for almost every world. Overall, they made sure that even when I had to revisit worlds, it didn't feel repetitive. Unfortunately, not every world hit the mark. Most worlds did stand out and were memorable, while others I would question the choices Square made. A few things I noticed are how linear and given most worlds felt compared to the original Kingdom Hearts. Every path felt laid out for me and I had no other choice to follow it. The original Kingdom Hearts didn't hold your hand, whereas Kingdom Hearts 2 felt like I was just handed the answers, which was disappointing when it's obvious they put a lot of thought and effort into these worlds. Worlds like the Timeless River, it was an unexpected and pleasant surprise. The black and white aesthetic, the old school sound design, along with Sora, Donald, and Goofy taking on old fashioned character models was an amazing blast from the past. The entire level, though it's short lived, had me smiling the entire time. Then there's worlds like Atlantica. Not that the original Atlantica was anything to talk highly of, but there was at least an attempt at underwater combat and a world to explore. Kingdom Hearts 2 throws all that away and turns it into a quick time event. On top of of constantly being locked out and having to return over and over, I just didn't enjoy it. I don't mind quick time events, but I feel like there was a missed opportunity where they could have improved on the original idea. In the end, I loved most of the worlds I visited. If anything, I wanted more time with them. I just wish that Square would have let us have the same freedom we had before. Which leads me to how well Kingdom Hearts 2 has aged over the years. It's obviously nothing like the next gen games offered nowadays, but when you take into consideration when it came out and the limitations of the PS2, this was top tier at the time. Every area I visited was detailed and suited to the world's aesthetic. Every gummy ship level I played was creative and fun. The costume changes between worlds added to the immersion and the list goes on. I can't think of a moment where I thought something stood out as distracting or out of place. Some cutscenes still jump between the faces being animated and not, but that can be justified by the limitation of the PS2. The jump from Kingdom Hearts 1 to 2 is a noticeable upgrade. Sora, Donald, and Goofy's character models are much smoother than before and more detailed. Even the Heartless receive an obvious bump in variety and detail. Like before, every world changes the Heartless to have a creative theme related to the area, so repeat enemies is almost non-existent. When it comes to the level progression and the combat we've grown to love, Kingdom Hearts 2 brings a balance of new and old to get the best of both worlds. The Keyblade makes its return, and as usual, it comes in multiple forms with different attributes and abilities. Aside from early game Keyblades, almost all of them are useful for one situation or another based on their abilities. Equipment hasn't changed much. Donald and Goofy have their signature staff and shield, but now all characters have an additional slot for armor alongside an accessory slot. The level progression is pretty much the same too. Kill Heartless and nobody's to gain experience. Certain skills, spells, and passive abilities are unlocked at specific levels, while other abilities and bonuses are locked behind defeating bosses. Just like Kingdom Hearts 1, all skills and abilities take AP to equip, and your characters only have a certain amount to begin with. Luckily, AP naturally grows with leveling, or you can use an AP boost item to raise it. Synthesizing is back, but this time it has its own leveling system, so now when you craft something, you gain experience for synthesizing. Leveling this up gives you access to more advanced items or equipment and lessens the cost of materials needed. Also, when you return to the Moogle with your materials, you're rewarded items based on what you return with. Which leads me to the combat that has a pretty noticeable improvement. As usual, it starts off pretty flat-footed and clunky, but as you level up and unlock abilities, it opens up to one of the most exciting, interchangeable, and fluid systems. More movement, combos, finishers, spells, and special limit attacks have been added or improved on, but the most noticeable addition has to be the drive gauge and forms. Sora can now take on special forms and in some cases wield two blades. In order to fill up the drive gauge, you have to defeat enemies and collect the drive orbs they drop. You're given the Valor Form in the beginning, which has the dual blades as mentioned before, and it focuses on physical attacks. You unlock more forms as you progress through the story, and each has its advantage in a specific field with the exception of the final form. Each form can be leveled up individually and have certain requirements that need to be met in order to earn experience. Also, in order to use these forms, you'll need Donald and or Goofy in your group, and they need to be alive. There is a consequence for overusing the drive forms, that is, the anti-form. This form happens randomly, but there's a hidden counter that goes up by one every time you go into a form. The counter brings your chances of changing into it higher. If you use the final form, it reduces the counter by 10. 
summons are back and follow a similar leveling system to forms. Luckily, you don't have to bring them to Merlin anymore. Once you have them, you can use them. Most are found in chests throughout your journey and are almost impossible to miss. Just like drive forms, they take the place of whoever's in your party and are very useful in the right situation. Enemies have the same creative approach as previous games. Most enemies you can smash attack, but there's also new enemies who need a little patience and strategy to defeat. Bosses are a little different. Whereas most bosses in previous games had mechanics and took a little thought to defeat, Kingdom Hearts 2 bosses are much less challenging and take less strategy. Most can be defeated by attacking head-on without thinking. There was a vast difference in creativity and learning curve than I expected. Some part of that may have to do with Donald and Goofy's AI being a lot more competent this time around. Donald still dies a lot, but much less than before and is actually useful in combat. I had much less luck with guest party members, unfortunately. I caught them standing around doing nothing, not attacking, and just dying more times than I care to count. I would instantly switch them out if the option was available. There is a little bit of saving grace though. Being able to somewhat control party members' behavior works wonders. Being able to choose what skills and spells are used and how often helped for making use of them in your own personal way or for what suits the situation. In addition to making fights easier, there is a second chance system where in certain boss fights, if you die, Mickey will take your place in the fight. As Mickey, you can build his drive gauge to revive Sora back to full health. If you die before filling the gauge, Sora will return with half his health. Fortunately, the chances of him appearing are lessened with every time he saves you. I won't say much of anything about the soundtrack for Kingdom Hearts 2 that anybody doesn't already know. It's great. I love it. Music for boss fights is thrilling and impactful, emotional scenes are on point, and even just running around to the Disney themes will never get old. One song I have to point out is The Other Promise. It's by far my favorite, especially for when it's used. It's perfect for capturing the moment and even had me emotional during the fight it was used for. As for the voice acting, it's a given that not every voice actor will be able to reprise their role for a game adaptation of their movies. That being said, both the ones who could reprise their role and the ones who had to replace the original voice actors did an amazing job. There was maybe one or two parts where something stood out or sounded a little off, but it wasn't anything earth shattering enough to call them out specifically. The standout for me has to be Xemnas without a doubt. I couldn't help but be drawn in with his performance. His presence, the voice given to him, and how he's portrayed just took the spotlight every time. If you ever feel like taking a break from the story, there's a handful of extra content you can take on. We'll start light with the puzzle pieces you can collect. There's various amounts in every world and are usually in obvious places with some being out of reach until you unlock certain abilities. Collecting them also unlocks many puzzle games that once solved reward you with special items. If that doesn't do it for you, you can visit the 100 acre wood with torn pages for the Winnie the Pooh minigames. This time around, Pooh has forgotten who all his friends are and every torn page helps him remember someone. Torn pages are much easier to find this time around as they're in chests in plain sight as you play through the story. I highly recommend returning with your torn pages as often as possible because you receive some very useful items, materials, and even a keyblade at one point. If you feel like just exploring, you can go searching for the 13 Heartless Mushrooms. Every one you find will have a special requirement for you to defeat them, and some won't be able to be defeated until Sora is much stronger. The reward for defeating all the Heartless Mushrooms is decent for items and material between all of them, and the final reward in itself. The Colosseum or Underdome returns with a minor disappointing twist. Most of what you're used to is still here. Challenging fights with and without dry forms, optional bosses at the end of each cup, and special rewards for completing them. The twist this time around is that you no longer gain experience in the fights. This probably won't be a huge loss for most, and it isn't to be honest, but I used to love grinding out the cups for experience, so this was a little disappointing for me. Finally, we have the optional bosses. First off, we have the Absent Silhouette Fights. These are fights against past Organization 13 members. There's five of them and technically they're just training for the data fights against harder versions of them and the rest of the Organization 13. If that's too much for you, then you can go looking for Sephiroth or the Lingering Soul. If there's any advice I'll give, it would be to wait until you're near level cap, if not add it, to fight the Lingering Soul. By the time I finished Kingdom Hearts 2, I had just under 40 hours clocked in. I found myself completely involved with this newly expanded world. Watching Sora, Riku, and Kairi's growth was moving. With Sora pursuing Riku after everything that happened just shows that as Sora matures and more serious tones are taken on, that he won't be persuaded from what matters most to him. His dedication to get Riku back and see Kairi again, despite everything and everyone trying to stop him, is just as, if not more, inspiring as the first Kingdom Hearts. 
Following Riku and seeing what he's willing to sacrifice to make up for his past was perfect for his character progression. Hiding his guilt and the choices he made to help bring Sora back just so Sora wouldn't worry made for an emotional full circle near the end. Unfortunately, Kairi still takes a back seat for the most part. I'm happy to see she's a little more involved and getting to see her with the same motivation to find Sora and Riku again was great for keeping me in suspense on if they would ever meet again. I'm hoping her arc gets a little more attention seeing as near the end of Kingdom Hearts 2 something is introduced that could let her be a lot more involved with Sora and Riku's adventures. In the end, I have to praise the direction the series went. I would have never guessed how complex the lore was going to be. I've been following this series in chronological order, so I've been fortunate enough to have played Birth by Sleep, 350 over 2 days, Chain of Memories, and Recoded. A lot of people have told me this isn't the best way, but I can't lie about the advantage it gave me in being able to understand Kingdom Hearts 2 better. I can't imagine how confusing going from 1 to 2 would be, but I can understand playing the games after can make for a more satisfying revelation. I obviously still have questions because of my knowledge of the other games, but I also still have 3 more games that will hopefully help with that. Overall, I loved Kingdom Hearts 2. It has quite a few changes that improve on the original. The gunship levels are better in every possible way, the combat is at its peak performance and shines best when you're testing your skill against some of the more challenging optional bosses, the visuals and sound design are an obvious upgrade, the continuation of the stories from old worlds felt natural, the new worlds are exciting and the voice actors bringing life to the characters tie it all together in an almost perfect bow. But like I mentioned before, it feels like Kingdom Hearts 2 was overly simplified when it came to exploring an overall challenge. Bosses are less creative and easy, even on critical mode, there's much less extra content replaced by an abundance of optional bosses. The extra content you do get has been changed to be less rewarding, and some of the worlds, especially the ones you have to revisit, have nothing to do with pushing the story forward. But I'll say it again, I loved Kingdom Hearts 2. Even with the issues I had, I still had more fun than I could have ever predicted. All I can hope for is that Kingdom Hearts 3 takes the best of both Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 to make a masterpiece I can praise from start to finish. And there you have it, my opinion on Kingdom Hearts 2 Final Mix. If you like this and want to see more, make sure to check out my last video on Edge of Eternity and click that subscribe button. If you want to see more of me, then head over to Twitch where I stream the games we'll be covering here. Link will be in the description. Thanks again and I hope to see you soon.